And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth. And what a great day it is to uh, check out the ongoing career of Hillary Rodham Clinton, the woman who would be president. I I mean, today there are both uh, serious commentators on the left who are saying she has lost control of her own image. Could that be true? And what about the nature of how she has maintained control all these years? There is a, um, a new book, and uh, it is a sensational new book. It's already wildly controversial, called Clinton, Inc., and it is by uh, Daniel Halper. He is a, uh, one of the editors at Weekly Standard. Uh, he is, in fact, online editor at Weekly Standard. And uh, I will say, in the interest of full disclosure, that uh, one of his sources on this book was uh, somebody who's known both Clintons for many, 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 many years. Can't claim to have kept up with them entirely, but uh, certainly once upon a time knew them each well. That would be me. Uh, 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. The book is called Clinton, Inc. The subtitle is The Audacious... A rebuilding of a political machine. Daniel, thanks very much for joining us. Michael, it's my pleasure. Well, first of all, I think that for so many people today, a Bill Clinton seems almost uh, saintly. And I was trying to figure this out, is how did he go from being sort of the, the, the guy that uh, we, we actually impeached and and somebody who who clearly was compromised in every way to being now, uh, at least according to some polls, the most admired American next to Billy Graham. Now, sort of Billy Graham and Bill Clinton don't have a whole lot in common. Uh, but I think and I, I want to get your read on that. Part of that is because compared to uh, President Obama, he seems likable. I think that's a huge component. President Obama has been great for President Clinton, and I I think the first person who would acknowledge that is President Clinton himself. I think President Obama is, his reputation at least, is one to be aloof and not a very, you know, sort of hands-on, caring individual, while President Clinton was, of course, always reaching out to Republicans and people sort of for, have seemed to have forgotten this cloud of impeachment and scandal that followed them when they left the White House. And I think a lot of that is uh, attributed to President Obama, but mostly it's attributed to President Clinton, who's worked his tail off in order to get to this point. President Clinton, of course, wants to be loved. That's his number one goal when he meets somebody is to win them over. And, uh, you know, since he essentially knows every, all the Americans and all the Americans know him, uh, he, he wants to win over everybody constantly. And this is something that drives President Clinton and into something that he has devoted not, uh, his whole life to, yes, and also especially the last 12 or 14 years leaving the White House in under this cloud of impeachment and scandal. One eight hundred nine five five seventeen seventy six. I one of the things that that your book reports is something that we spoke about when we were speaking, and that I've always believed, which is it's generally believed. If you sort of ask conservatives in general, what about the two Clintons? They'll say, well, Bill, he's this lovable doofus. He's a good old boy. He's Bubba. He uh, liked to eat at McDonald's and. He's a real people person, but he's not that bright. And Hillary, oh, my gosh, she's a towering genius, but she's an evil genius, and she's cold and controlling. And I always tell people, uh, people who think that don't know either of these two people, uh, because Bill is monumentally bright. He's monumentally intelligent. Uh, Hillary is certainly bright, but she's not on Bill's level. And she's actually, and and you report this in your book, Clinton Inc. is, by the way, posted up at our website at michaelmedved.com. Hillary is a warmer, nicer, friendlier, more caring person uh, than you would expect, and much more so than her husband. Yeah? That's absolutely correct. You know, I I think I heard it first from you when when I interviewed you, and I didn't quite, I have to be honest, I didn't quite believe it. But the more I talk to people who, knew, who know them well and know them personally, this sense just kept on coming up. And it, and it was bizarre because it's, 
so much has been written about the Clintons, and yet I don't think that many people have really touched on this aspect of it, which I think is really goes to the heart of explaining who they are. I mean, Bill tends to be more cold and calculating in the way that people think of Hillary, and Hillary tends to be sort of more warm and likable in, in the way people think of the emotive and gregarious Bubba, uh, if you will. And so I think, I mean, ultimately this tends to be a problem for Hillary because at her root she isn't the, uh, she isn't the politician that Bill Clinton is. And at her root, she is a sort of a more normal and more likable person. And it's hard to really do very well in politics, I, I, I think. I try to make this case. If you're, if you're too likable, you know? And, and so she sort of pretends to be a politician. And it's the pretendingness that, that really gets her into, uh, I think, trouble. I mean, for instance, this dead broke comment that, that she made. <laughs> this dead broke comment... Incidentally, totally accurate, absolutely true. They were $12 million in debt. Of course, they had the disability to get it back and everything. So when she speaks honestly like that, she comes across as aloof and sort of not the smooth political maneuver that you would expect from a polished politician. Bill Clinton would, doesn't, wouldn't make a mistake like that, I don't think, and ultimately because he wouldn't tell the truth about being dead broke because he'd realize that the truth would sound so bad to Americans and sounds sort of hollow in a way that I think uh, sort of goes to explaining their strengths and their weaknesses and how they help and, and sometimes hurt each other. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. Uh, you write about the Clinton political machine, this incredible network of, of wealthy and talented and prominent people, some of whom folks have heard of, some of whom they haven't heard of. Uh, what would you rate right now would as the likelihood that this um, a political machine will succeed in producing a Hillary Clinton presidency in 2017 after the election of 2016? I'd, I'd probably rate it at about 50 percent. On the one hand, I think she wants it. I, I, I disagree with you in that I think she sort of always has want, wanted it in a way that uh, – and, and she's always had this ambition, maybe not always going back to law school, but always since entering the White House with Bill Clinton. Sure. And uh, I think she really wants it, but I think that there are problems. The, you know, first being herself as a candidate. Uh, also, a massive problem is her husband, who is a, tends to be both a massive political a asset, but also a, just as equally can be as big of a liability. And so I think it's 50%. If she runs, it could it could crash and burn. She she was inevitable before, and and she's not president. So it's not. I think anybody who who pretends like she will definitely win is wrong. But I also think that you know you can't discount these people. These are these are enormously talented politicians. Uh, despite me saying that Hillary's not as good of a politician. And she she like. has she still has her favorable rating. Apparently has gone down since the book tour. But her favorable to unfavorable rating is still almost two to one. Uh, Bill's is even higher right now. What what would you expect uh, when you say that Bill Clinton could be a liability? How would that play out, Daniel Halper? Well, a lot of aides that I talk to note Bill Clinton is a political genius. He is just a mastermind, and he's so good at winning people over and on a one-to-one, -one, just so impressive. And so they were shocked, I, I report, when they saw him just implode in the 2008 uh, campaign. And they were shocked that this is a man that is so good. How could he be doing so badly? And they couldn't help but wonder whether or not this is the cold, calculating Bill Clinton coming up and whether or not he doesn't want his – or whether or not he's conflicted about his wife becoming the president of the United States. Of course, Bill Clinton has cheated on his wife before, perhaps they thought – this is another case of him cheating on his wife, of doing, of pledging to do one thing to help her campaign, and in fact, behind her back, or, or not, because it was on TV screens, uh, doing the opposite and hurting it. Do you, do you think they're likely to campaign together, or they will send Bill off uh, doing separate campaigning, or will Bill, I don't know, go to, to Asia on some kind of goodwill tour? No, I think, I think Bill is too much of a strength to just 
discount him directly and immediately. And I think you have to include Bill. I think any calculus will. And I think, I think also Bill will want to be included. And it's hard to say no to the former president. And it's hard, especially for Hillary, who is, I, I think, still dreary eyed. Uh, she no, not dreary eyed. Absolutely dreamy eyed. There's no doubt. Daniel Halper, not dreamy eyed. He's uh, gimlet-eyed concerning Clinton, Inc. That's the title of his new book. It's posted on our website at michaelmedved.com. We'll be right back with your calls, questions, and challenges. 1-800-955-1776. 21 minutes after the hour on The Michael Medved Show, where it's easy to save 15% or even more on car insurance with GEICO. Just go to geico.com or call 1-800-947-AUTO. And the only hard part is figuring out which way is even easier And it's easy to see why uh, the new book, Clinton, Inc., by Daniel Halper of the Weekly Standard, has generated uh, a great deal of uh, controversy and curiosity. It is an up-close look at how the Clintons went from being dead broke, in Hillary's word, being deeply in debt, being to some extent disgraced and humiliated, to being, in many respects, the most admired uh, couple in the country. Uh, uh, Daniel, I, I think we spoke about this before, but, but my assumption is people always ask the question, how do these two people who are both each one in his own right or her own right, remarkable, how do they stay together? And my line always is that they actually have everything in common because it is completely true that just as she did when she first told me about, about him and her involvement with him, Hillary loves, adores, admires, and worships Bill. And Bill loves, adores, admires, and worships Bill. So basically, they share everything. But how does that work if Hillary is the candidate? Well, I think you're exactly right. You know, I I quote that line all all the time because just because I think it's so great and so correct. Uh, Somebody asked me yesterday, is there love in this marriage? I said, there's tons of love in this marriage. Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, and I quoted that line saying that, that all the love is directed toward Bill Clinton, the love, the love from her and the love from him. Um, this is a massive problem. I mean, this is, this is the conundrum that Hillary faces in, in 2016 if she's going to continue in politics. And I don't know how she escapes it, really. I'm, I, unfortunately, I'm not really able to answer this. My, my, uh, I think the take, one of the takeaways from the book is that she will, at some point, have to make a choice between sort of keeping her family close or becoming the next president, because I think her family can just pose such problems to her that it, they, that she might not actually be able to overcome it. Well, let's let's go to Barbara in Orlando, Florida. Barbara, you're on the Michael Medved show with Daniel Halper. Hi, thank you. So, just from this distance, watching Bill and Hillary over the years, I believe that they have come to a kind of an understanding in their relationship. And I think I don't know how much love there is, or if they're in love anymore, or any of that. It's been a long time. But I think they've come to an understanding about their relationship and might even be thinking of each other as great friends or family, which is what they are. And I think conservatives or Republicans make a big mistake to um, rattle up that relationship and what Bill does and all that in an effort to discredit or bring down Hillary. I don't think it'll work. I, I, by the way, Barbara, I completely agree with you. I, and look, I, I, I will say this. They have been married for... Well, it's it's uh, I believe it's over 40 years now or very close to it. They've been married for a very long time and they have kept a marriage together, which conservatives are supposed to admire for a very long time. Uh, Daniel Halper. Look, I'm not my the, the purpose of this book is not to bring down the Clintons. The purpose of this book is to, as I see it through my reporting, to explain how they work and how they operate. So I agree essentially that this is a good way to bring down the Clintons. But my argument is I'm not trying to bring down the Clintons. Let, let the next Republican nominee or, frankly, the next, you know, in the Democratic primary, Hillary Clinton will have to face these battles. My goal was to really understand the Clintons and to be able to tell this arc of a story coming from, you know, the, the cloud of impeachment and scandal to where they are today, which is, which is correctly, uh, I think, uh, you know, headed toward the White House. And so I'm not... 
you know, this isn't, uh, I, I say many, I think, uh, although I'm sure I won't get credit for this, I say many nice things and complimentary things of Bill Clinton and Hillary. I call Bill Clinton a political genius, and I call Hillary pretty likable. But right. it's not. You're likable you know, enough, it, Hillary. Exactly. <laughs> to, to, to quote, enough, to quote as Obama said. That's exactly right. Let's go to John in Seattle. John, you're on the MedVed Show with Daniel Halper, author of Clinton, Inc. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, I'm going to assume you're both familiar with Juanita Broderick's uh, charges or allegations that Bill brutally raped her in a hotel room when he was Attorney General of Arkansas. And there was, of course, a total news blackout after that about that story. And I'm wondering if you uh, think the Clinton machine, as you put it, can continue to suppress that story throughout the electoral process next time around. And if it does come out, if it will destroy her chances. Daniel Halper. Well, Bill Clinton, when he left the White House, he he lost his law license for five years over a sexual harassment charge. So he has had a series of sexual, you know, that was, I'm of course, referring to the Paula Jones scandal. So he has had a series of these charges, and sometimes they're as bad as the Broderick, and sometimes they're as bad as uh, as Paula Jones. Uh, uh, the point being that he can, he can actually survive them. I don't know whether that's a sign of who he is or who we are as, as Americans, uh, but, uh, you know, I think more women are going to come, are going to become, either come forward or be put forward, and I think it will continue to be a problem. I don't know if it, that's an insurmountable problem. Let's uh, go to Bob in Springfield, Illinois. Bob, you're on the Michael Medved Show with Daniel Halper. Hi, Michael. Hi, Daniel. Uh, quickly before my uh, question, which I would like to see how both of your opinions differ, I'd like to give a shout-out to my station, WTIM, for bringing, hosting you. And I'm going to kind of pile on and ask this question in a different way of your previous caller. Considering the fact, and I guess this is good for conspiracy theories, is that now we know why there was China Gate, while Hillary had to take all the China because she didn't have much money. I guess she was going to pawn them. <laughs> but uh, considering both of their records on women and in two different ways, and Benghazi and a whole plethora of other issues, which I'm not totally familiar with, I would like to pin both of you down and see if you disagree on which single issue of Hillary's will cause her the most problem if she were to run for president. Uh, Daniel? Well, like I said, I, I suggest that her husband is actually the biggest problem because because of his mixed motivations and because of his deep and unforgiving love for himself. I, I, I would say it's her record as Secretary of State, and uh, and that should be the biggest problem, including Benghazi, but not limited to it. Look, the reset with Russia, which she calls a brilliant stroke, uh, even today, has been a disaster. And it should uh, not uh, uh, be lost on the American people, but the world right now is falling apart. America's position in the world is, is a terrible decline. And she was Secretary of State for four years, presiding over a great deal of that and just getting out from the wreckage, uh, maybe she hopes, just in time. But she's going to have a, a lot of explaining to do. Uh, Daniel, I hope you can stay uh, uh, stay on with us because one other thing I want to bring up, the, the one thing that seems to be lacking from Hillary Clinton as opposed to other successful presidential candidates is identification with some kind of policy or cause or something. Barack Obama won an impassioned sport because he was against the war in Iraq. What is Hillary's big issue? We'll get to that and more with the author of Clinton, Inc. and your calls coming up. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. Michael Medved Show. 1-800-955-1776. That's 1-800-955-1776. MichaelMedved.com. 34 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, where you can uh, sign up for something great for free. Uh, what can you sign up great for free for? The uh, Medved Newsletter, which comes out every week, uh, reviewing new movies. For instance, this last week we... Uh, covered both uh, Wish I Was Here and Heaven Help Us Sex Tape, which is already bombing deservedly. Uh, we are um, all available if you just go to michaelmedved.com and sign up for our newsletter, no charge at all. 
And in our newsletter, you can also find information about the uh, new book, Clinton, Inc., by Daniel Halper of the Weekly Standard. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. Daniel, one of the things I was struggling to try to understand is the, um, uh, I mean, again, I knew Hillary years and years and years ago. I've only seen her a couple of times since then, and and not with any sort of uh, deep intensity or anything like that. But um, the 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 fascination that some people have with Hillary Clinton, there, there's this piece in uh, The Stylist, which is a British magazine, which is was featured in the Washington Free Beacon because it's so funny. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the piece on Stylist magazine it uh, says, uh, as I crammed years of Hillary's utterly mind-blowing life into just a week, something else dawned on me. I had never, would never, experienced busyness like Hillary. Hard Choices details the life of someone special, a woman with a huge capacity for understanding, a woman with an exceptional EQ and IQ. She was responsible for the most difficult of decisions, those that deal with life and death. I soon learned that her laugh is a signature move, warm, relaxed, and utterly disarming. And it's when talking about women that she becomes most animated and exemplifies those attributes she so admires in other women, sensitivity, experience, and worldliness. And and it, it just goes on and on and on basically about how meeting with Hillary for about 15 minutes, which is what she did, is um, a life-changing experience. She says, all I can say in conclusion is that Hillary was warm, engaging, charismatic, ambitious, smart, determined, and busier than any other woman I am ever likely to meet. Uh, what, what do you think this kind of reaction is based on, Daniel? It's, it's funny that, that you, that the word busy kept on coming up because when I asked AIDS, what, what are her, or people who like her, I mean, I'm not talking just about her critics. When I talk to people who like her and I said, well, what is it about Hillary that's so good? You know, what, why, what, what's her strength? Without fail, I think most people would say, She's such a hard worker. Mm-hmm. And you think to yourself, well, that's right. Th- th- that, that's a pretty good attribute. You want somebody who's uh, a politician to be working hard. But what does that mean? What does she then stand for? And, what is, and so there's sort of this vapidness to the hardworkingness, which is a good attribute, but it's also, you know, it's not, necess- it's not this positively good, right? It's not always good. And so it's, it's a weird compliment to pay her. But I, I, I don't want to, you know, I think Hillary Clinton, uh, back in the day in Arkansas, she was on the board of Walmart. Now she's trying to sort of fiddle around with this populist message that kind of sounds empty, you know, when she's accepting $200,000 from Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs to give a speech. I think the one issue, uh, I'll have to agree with this preposterous uh, profile that you read, the one issue that she has actually been consistent on are women issues. And I think if you look at the book, book rollout, if you look at the things that she did at the State Department, um, if you look at sort of what she did as First Lady, the one thing that is consistent is this women issue. And I think Clinton aides uh, wrongly, really, attribute President Obama's election solely to him being a historic president. Because I don't think that he – I mean, I think maybe that helped in certain ways – but it's not just that he was historic, right? But I think that when they're envisioning a Hillary presidency or candidacy, at least, what they're envisioning is that she would be historic in, as a first woman. In, in other words, no Obama. other no other issue matters. What matters is breaking the ultimate glass ceiling, and and of course that is their hope. Uh, President Obama did well with women, but um, he actually lost white women, and he lost white women by a substantial margin to Mitt Romney. So um, Hillary, I think the assumption is, does much better. When we come back, does much better. What does she say is her big issue? We will get to that with your calls coming up. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. Forty-four minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show with Daniel Halper. He is the author of Clinton, Inc., 
the audacious rebuilding of a political machine. And one of the useful things in this book is it um, helps people recall, and there are lots of younger people out there who have no memory of this because they are frankly too young. They're going to be voting. Voters between the ages of 18 and 29 and have no recollection of what the last years of the Clinton administration were like or of some of the disgrace associated with his last-minute pardons of Mark Rich and other people and the uh, looting of the White House, which was controversial by the Clintons as they made way for the Bushes. Uh, and, and by the way, it, it, it's hard to believe today. But Bill Clinton, and the book makes it clear, still believes that the reason that Al Gore lost the election, that he didn't get that 500 extra votes in Florida that he needed to win the election, is because he didn't want Bill Clinton campaigning for him. Can you imagine anyone today not wanting Bill Clinton campaigning for him? Uh, Daniel, let us go to uh, calls. Let's go to Eric in Houston. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Daniel Halper. Hello, Michael and Daniel. I appreciate your show and uh, the discussion that you guys are bringing. Um, well, to me, I just got a question. To me, Bill Clinton has always been a crafty person for power. So my question is, could Bill Clinton run as vice president with, say, Al Gore or run the country uh, through Hillary if she were elected president? Daniel Halper? I, I think that's probably a little extreme to, to suggest that he would be vice president, but I, I I don't think that he would sit in the White House idly uh, and not do anything. This is the problem for Bill Clinton, I think, from what I've been told, is that Bill Clinton is a little weary about being restricted about going back into the White House. It's not a great lifestyle. I mean, look at Michelle Obama, the spouse of a president. You sort of get up, you do these, you know, let's move lunches, and, and you shake a lot of hands. But you really, should, you know, you're not, you don't take too big of a role. I guess Hillary did, but I don't think Bill, as a former president, could, could sort of pass that by. And it's not a great lifestyle compared to what he has today, which is traveling the world, hanging out with global elites, making a lot of money, and living a good life. He would be under such scrutiny that his, his current life is imperiled by, the, by a return to the White House. And, and Eric, just so that you know, most constitutional scholars, in fact, I won't say most, I think virtually all, uh, Bill Clinton would be ineligible to be uh, a candidate for vice president or to be elected vice president under the 22nd Amendment. The 22nd Amendment to the Constitution excludes him from uh, running for the presidency because he's already served two terms. And uh, I, I believe that uh, we, it's very clear that if you're not eligible to run for president, you're not eligible to run for vice president. You need the same qualifications. So <laughs> why, why, why Bill Clinton would want to be vice president, unless he had uh, evil designs, and I don't think he does, on uh, bumping off Hillary, I think it's most unlikely. Let's go to uh, Sam in San Antonio. Sam, you're on the Michael Medved Show with Daniel Halper. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hey. Hey, uh, Michael, uh, you know, in, in 08, uh, Bush was asked a question about what if Hillary wins? And Bush said, and I remember this interview, I remember I visualized it in my mind, where Bush said, George W., that, it, hey, that'd be pretty cool. You know, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Clinton. My question to you guys, and Michael, I know you pride yourself as a historian, that probably without, with the exception of Roosevelt, when have we been in a situation in this country to where it's this this two key this, this two family dominance of presidential politics. Well, of two families, uh, never. I mean, the Kennedy family. Uh, when when John Kennedy was a, a candidate a contender for the vice presidency in '56, and then he was the presidential uh, nominee in '60, and. Then his brother Robert ran for the presidency in 68, was assassinated before he could win. And then Ted Kennedy, of course, was considered to be a big presidential policy ever after that. So that was a that was a the longest period of domination by one family. But you're right. We've never had a, a, a situation in presidential history where there have been these two uh, sort of warring families who also have elements of warm friendship. Uh, uh, Daniel, I don't know if you know about this, but but people say uh, very credibly that Bill Clinton and and the Bushes, uh, both Presidents Bush, are genuinely close. They've become good friends. Is that your I, understanding? I actually, 
Yeah, I actually devote an entire chapter to this idea because uh, to me it's it's sort of an important notion that Bush uh, has played a major role in resurrecting Clinton, and Clinton likewise is now playing a, a role in resurrecting the Bushes. And you know, for instance, in the in the 2008 campaign, um, President Clinton made some uh, remarks that were considered by some, certainly in the Obama campaign, as being racially insensitive. Uh, George Bush picked up the phone from the Oval Office and called Bill Clinton to check in because that's what friends do. They call friends on days that are bad for each other. I think, uh, I, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical and a little dubious. My, my uh, inclination through, through my reporting, as I, as I kind of make clear in the book, is I'm a little dubious that it's a sincere relationship. I just think that when you're a political dynasty, as, as the Bushes are and as the Clintons are, you do things, you do a lot of things out of political expediency. And sometimes it's really difficult to separate the political expediency from, 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 from what is not of political expediency. And I think this is one of those relationships where, where that is really important. Uh, let's go quickly to Paul in Atlanta. Paul, you're on the MedVed Show with Daniel Halper. Yes, I was wondering if it really matters who the Republicans run against Democrats, because the Republican Party has become the party of rich, angry white men. I mean, we won't give this president any credit for the uh, Wall Street, the recovery, the Dow Jones being at its high. The Republican Party does not appeal to anybody but rich, angry white men. Okay, uh, uh, Daniel Helper, quick response. I think Marco Rubio could be a sharp contrast uh, to, to Hillary Clinton, both in age, both in background, both in experience. Um, I, I, think, I think the Republicans will have some problems, certainly. They, they always do. They, uh, but but um, I, I, think, I think they'll be all right. We'll talk about some other names. Bobby Jindal, Paul Ryan. Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush would almost surely be Hillary's favorite candidate to run against. Not because she could beat him necessarily, but because, well, we'll tell you why. Coming up with Daniel Halper, author of Clinton, Inc. The Michael Medved Show. MichaelMedved.com. Fifty-five minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, one of the things that is ironic, as I'm speaking with Daniel Halper, he is the author of Clinton, Inc., which is posted up at our website at michaelmedved.com. It is subtitled, The Audacious Rebuilding of a Political Machine. We just had a caller who called in and said, oh, it doesn't matter who the Republicans nominate, they can't win because they're the angry of uh, uh, rich, angry white people. I believe is the term uh, that he put it. Uh, uh, Daniel, the one thing that strikes me about that is uh, that, um, let's see, rich white people, that would be Bill and Hillary Clinton. There are reports that she has made $16 million since uh, she left the State Department, which, which after all is less than two years ago. So that would put her not in the top 1%. That would put her in the top 0.001% in terms of earning in this country. And if you look at what the president of the United States is doing right now, I mean, he's winging his way to Seattle. He is uh, sitting down for a $20,000 a plate dinner with the uh, a former uh, CEO of Costco, Jim Senegal. He's uh, meeting in sh- with Shonda Rhimes, the TV producer in L.A., uh, how how is it that Republicans, who are not the party of people who are rich, it's a party of people who are working to try to get rich, uh, how is it that 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 kind of rhetoric still works? Well, I think I think I, I spoke uh, before the end of the break. I said the Republicans are fine. What I meant was that I'm sure the Republicans work work their way out of this, you know. And I think the Republicans do have a problem where they do come off as the party of rich and. But I think Hillary Clinton, uh, as you're suggesting, I think uh, point offers a great alternative to the Republicans because if she is the one who is accepting two hundred thousand dollar checks from Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, and if she and her husband are the ones who made forty million dollars off of book deals and over a hundred million dollars on speaking engagements alone over the last decade and a half, I think a Republican can then take sort of a more middle-class uh, 
route and sort of uh, an appeal and sort of draw this contrast from Hillary Clinton. And I think I think that in a way, a Hillary Clinton candidacy offers that promise to the Republican Party, which could be beneficial to them because, as your caller suggests, there is this perception that is hounding them and that is hurting them. Right. There's no doubt. What's fascinating to me is how close to your book, the book is called Clinton, Inc., uh, Hillary's response when she was challenged on this idea that she was like Mitt Romney and uh, like other rich people and people would confuse her. And she says, no, no, I work really hard. I've worked for it. We, Bill and I have worked for everything we've gotten. It's as if uh, the um, a Republican middle class people who are striving to try to make some money and maybe even save some money and maybe even provide for our kids, as if people like that don't work hard. That's a strange point of view, but lots of strange material in uh, the new book, Clinton, Inc. It will open eyes and uh, maybe even open some minds in this greatest nation on God's green earth.